feel as listening to the, the, the video, <clears throat> we talk a lot about, you know, when we're, when things are down, when things, you know, in, in church, and we talk about how, you know, God's there for us when things are down. And I think it's also really good for us to remember that when things are going smoothly, God is also there for us. Because, boy, isn't it so easy just to lose sight of a God that we need when things are hard, but, boy, when things are smooth sailing, it is so easy to just kick back and do whatever feels good. And so, I, so as we get into this, uh, this conversation uh, here this morning, I think that's really, I think that's really important for us to, to, to remember that God's not just there in the hard times, but God, I think he keeps calling us like a magnet, he keeps calling our attention back to him, even when things are smooth, so that when things turn, and we know they will, that now we're not <laughs> bottoming out because we've spent the last whatever just doing, you know, whatever, whatever was feeling good at the time. So, well, uh, so my name is Jim Franks. I'm one of the pastors here, and I am, I get to talk today, and... My best friend. Yes. But before we get to this guy, um, I love trees. How many tree lovers are here? Yeah. Isn't it just good to look at trees? Trees are fascinating. They absolutely fascinate me. When we, uh, we, do, uh, when we go on vacation, we like to go hiking. We like to go and, and just look at nature. I bring, my ca- I bring my phone normally on those times because I love to take pictures of trees. I want to share four pictures with you of trees that absolutely fascinated me. Two of the first two that we're going to look at, uh, we saw at the uh, Cuyahoga National Forest. Um, so here's the first one. What I am just so... Here's my other part of uh, technology. So what I am just fascinated about... How does a tree grow in a rock? There's no, there's no dirt there. I don't understand how that works. But you think this tree is not a little tree. That's, I don't know how many hundreds of pounds that thing is. And that thing is just sitting on top of a rock. Now, the, the, the roots, you, know, you see the roots go down here to this nice lady here with the pink shirt on. I don't know how in the world that that keeps that up, but these roots are powerful. The roots of trees are powerful. Let's take a look at this next one. I really don't get this one. Look at that thing. This is what's holding this tree up. It's sitting on this little ledge here, and it's finding its sustenance someplace, and it's growing. And you look up here, and there's actually leaves on those, on those uh, branches up there. Fascinating. But the strength of the roots of this tree is what's keeping this thing up. All right, these next two were when we were down in Arizona. This picture, I love this picture, because I don't know, how in the world did this guy get up there? <laughs> if you've been to Arizona and been to these rock formations, these red rock formations, there's like no dirt up here. And I, maybe a bird, you know, <laughs> came in one end, went out the other, and all of a sudden there's a tree up there. I don't know how that worked, but that is, I, I love that picture. Um, and then, okay, then the last one, this is my favorite, this is my, my favorite pictures from, um, from vacations, from any of the vacations we've gone on. I love this picture of this tree. This tree is, I mean, this dude is thick. And, and there is no dirt here. This is a rock. These roots are growing down in between rocks. And I don't know if it split the rocks open or what. But, you know, how many windstorms uh, have beaten against this tree? And this thing is still upright. And it's because of the root system that, that, um, that is in this tree. And so, um, so, you know, let's think back to a couple summers ago when that windstorm went through. How many of you guys lost trees in that storm? Yeah, but anybody that had a tree in their yard uh, had some kind of damage. Um, 
I remember spending part of the day down at Jesse and Carol's place because their, their backyard looked like a war zone. And, um, and then I remember going over to Mike Kinesis' place. Um, he used to be a part of our church. And, um, and it was the same thing. But what was interesting, when you think about those trees that were lost during that time, I think there was three, kind of, three main forms of damage. Some of those trees lost branches. Some of the trees were actually broken off. Some of the trees were completely uprooted. And, and, I, th- and I think that um, the strength of those trees had to do with the root system that that tree had. If that tree was completely uprooted in that storm, we can look at it, and we had one of those in our backyard, and all of the, all of the, 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 the roots it was an old pine tree, and they were just right along the surface of the ground. So when that wind hit that thing, there was nothing anchoring it in. Wind comes through, it just topples the whole thing over, roots are up, and this tree is now dead. But the deeper and the thicker these roots are, the stronger this tree is. Now what's really cool is throughout our scriptures, we see a number of places where where God compares us as believers to trees. See, he does it over and over. Uh, if, you've got your, if you've got your Bibles, let's open up to, we're gonna look at three of these really short passages. First one's in Psalm chapter one. Psalm one, verses one through three. Says this. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. Now that last line is pretty, those those last three promises are pretty significant. If, If our roots are going down deep, then there are these, these three things that he says. It yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not prosper. And what, what's that? Wither. Well, what did I say? <laughs> yeah, leaves don't prosper. And whose leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. Those are pretty good, those are pretty good promises. But they are dependent, they are absolutely dependent on our roots going deep our roots sinking into the person of God himself. Those things can happen, but they're dependent on that. Okay, let's take a look, flip back a little bit to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17. It's just verse seven and eight here. Jeremiah 17, seven and eight. Says this, but blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him, He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Have you experienced the drought? If we're alive, we've experienced the drought emotionally, spiritually, we've experienced that. And he says, even in the drought, even in the drought, even when the heat comes, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. How do you handle the droughts in your life when they come? Do you, are you like this guy who does not have worries or does the anxiety kick up and now you are being run by, well, what if, well, what if, what if this, what if that, what if all these things happen? If we are being run by the what ifs, we are, our, our roots, if you are being led by the what ifs, your roots are not sunk deep into God. They're not. Because it said, even it says here, if your roots are sunk deep, you're not going to experience that. You're not going to experience anxiety. It's not going to happen because the trust is there. Does this make sense? Amen. 
Okay, let's keep on rolling. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17, 17 through 19. He's back to this tree thing. He's again. So Jesus says, Matthew 17, 17 through 19, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Think back to a couple weeks when Sam was teaching about, about the fruits that grow. The three, remember with the three soils, hard-packed soil, the, uh, the rocky soil, and the weedy soil. Those three soils, well, the second, the second to the, the rocky soil and the weedy soil, the plant started to grow, right? The plant started to grow, but what did they not do? They didn't bear fruit. Those plants did not bear fruit. When we as believers are bearing fruit in our, life, our lives, it is evidence that we are hooked in to our Lord and Savior. Amen. When we are not bearing fruit, that is also evidence that we are not hooked into our Lord and our Savior. It doesn't matter what we say. It, our words, meaningless. Our actions, and the fruit that grows in our lives, that is the proof and the evidence of a deep relationship with God. If the evidence isn't there, the relationship isn't there either. We have to be willing to be honest with ourselves and recognize, is there fruit, spiritual fruit growing in my life? If I am willing to be honest with myself and say, yes, there is fruit growing in my life, now I can rest in the fact that my relationship with God is secure. If I look at myself and I say, mm, I really don't see a whole lot of this fruit. And what is the fruit? The fruit is the, just, it's the proof. It's, it's when people look at you, do they see something different than they see in the world? If they do, there's probably fruit growing in your life. We've, we're given a list of the fruits of the Spirit in the book of Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. When, there are, when there's, those things are obviously growing in our lives, it is proof that we are hooked in to our Lord. When those things are not growing in our lives, it is also proof that we are not hooked into our Lord. And so, for us, we need to be able to look at ourselves honestly and say, are these things a part of my life? Am I growing in these things? If I'm not growing in these things, then I've got a problem. And hopefully, I care enough to want to take action to make whatever change is necessary to allow those fruit to start growing. Okay, does this all make sense so far? Okay, good. So, for those of us who have gone through Equip, one of the main teachings that we, that we talk about, we're going to kind of give a, um, a real bird's eye view of this. All right, so let's go back to what Sam talked about two weeks ago. The seed of the gospel is sown. Every one of us has, because we're here, we've heard the seed of the gospel is sown. The gospel says, Jesus is is the son of God. He was born to the Virgin Mary. He, he, he lived, he died, was crucified, went in the ground, came up from the ground, is now at the right hand of God the Father. That is the message of, that is in this seed that every single person here, we get the chance to either accept or reject. That seed is going to go into the ground. It's going to get planted. Now, once that is planted, hopefully, hopefully that seed is going to grow, depending on what we have done with our soil of our hearts. As this seed starts to grow, it's going to, it's going to form a tree. It's no longer a seed. It's going to grow a tree. Now, this is how the tree grows strong. When, 
we choose to allow the roots of our life sink into God and our relationship with God, our relationship with God is going to grow. It's going to, our relationship with God is going to affect all of the priorities in our lives. The priorities in our lives are the things that we're living out. That's what people see. So some of us is going to be our family. Some of us is going to be our job. Some of us, it might be our friends. Whatever that is for you, whatever your priorities are, that's the things that are up here in the tree. As we are growing in our relationship with God, we are being filled with his love. His love is is coming up into this parts of our lives and he is going to ele- and he is going to begin to grow those fruits of the spirit that's when the fruit of love starts to grow in my family it's when the f- when i go to work and i might be working next to some knuckleheads and i can still grow the fruit of self discipline i can still grow the fruit of patience and kindness. Same way with my friends. Same with all of our priorities. They're up here in a tree. When we have sunk our roots into God, he is going to allow us to live out all of this stuff successfully and in a way that honors him. Okay, now, what do these roots look like? These are the things that we call the spiritual disciplines. When we are reading our Bibles, that is one of those roots that hooks us into God himself because we also know that the Bible is called God's what? If you want to hear God speak, you have to what? I got to read the Bible because that's his word. I can't just sit around and hope he's going to, I'm going to hear voices. I, if I want to hear God's word and if I want to know that what I'm hearing is the word of God, I go to what's called the word of God. So if I am reading, my roots are being sunk into God himself. It's going to be things like prayer. Prayer. As I am praying, my roots are going deeper into God himself. Uh, so we just got through our, our period of, of fasting uh, through January and February. Fasting is another one of these spiritual disciplines. It, we don't earn God's grace. We don't earn anything. These are just ways that we put ourselves in his way so that we are going to hear him speak. I remember hearing Pastor Tim say that one time. There's not a whole lot of 100% assurances in our, in our world that says, you know, if I do this, God will this. But if I am doing the spiritual disciplines, I am putting myself in a position to be connected with God. And then he will work with me however he wants me to because he says he will. He says that he is always working in us, working our our salvation in us. It's our responsibility to be obedient by doing these spiritual disciplines. That's our part. God's part is then he takes what we're doing and he changes our hearts. He changes us from the inside so that it comes to the outside. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, we have problems when we put our priorities under the soil. When we start drawing life from our priorities, we are creating an, in, an unstable foundation. Say I put my family down here. It wasn't a whole lot, it wasn't too long ago when we went through that COVID time and a lot of us lost loved ones, we lost friends. And when those things happen, when those people are under our soil, we are asking, we are asking to live in anxiety. 
because someone's going to die. Someone's going to leave. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to stab us in the back. Someone's going to disappoint us and let us down. And when those are the people that are under our soil, we are just asking for, for to be disappointed. We are asking to live in an unstable way because what we are dependent on is no longer a person named God. If you want to live without anxiety, if you want to live without those types of things, you have to sink your roots deep into God. Because there is, because when you, when you start when you start to experience God doing things in your life that only God can do, your foundation will strengthen and multiply. Because when you trust him, he comes through. Which makes you want to do what? More. Trust him more. And then he comes through again. Which makes us want to trust him more. But when I trust in someone else and they let me down, that's when people say, I have trust issues. Why? Because you got the people in your life, the priorities in your life in the wrong place. They don't, you don't want your priorities down here. You want your priorities up here. You want to love the people in your life with God's love. You don't want to suck life out of your family members. When you put people down here, you become a leech. We become leeches to them because we are now dependent on someone for our lives that they were not equipped to be. The people in our lives are not meant to be what God is because they're human. And so when we depend on people who are human and they let us down, then who do we normally get mad at? We might, might get mad at them. But might get, God, why did you let that happen? God isn't the one that put them under the soil. We put them down there. We shouldn't get mad at God. We should change. Let God be down here. Let these people be up here. Now I'm giving to my family. At Christmas time, we always say that. It's more blessed to give than receive. Imagine a life where the people in our lives, we are just giving to them. When God is under my soil, when I am drawing my sustenance from God himself, now I can live that way. I can live giving, giving, giving. Yeah, but what if people take advantage of you? Who cares? This is where my life is found. If someone takes advantage of me, that's between them and God. They're going to deal with the consequences of that. They hurt me. Yeah, I might have to forgive them. Well, yes, I'm going to have to forgive them. But if, I, but if, if, I have to, if that person is under my soil and my life is built on that person, whoo, that's a storm that doesn't come from up here. That's, a, that's an earthquake that comes from under the ground. Now I've got problems. Some people put themselves, I depend on myself, it's up to me. This is going to happen, it's up to me. How does that feel in anxiety? When I am dependent on myself for what I need in life, what happens if I get sick? What happens if I get injured? What happens if I lose my job? That's scary. Whatever is under your soil, anything that's under your soil that's not called God, capital G God, not the little G gods that we put under here, because these are the little G gods. Any of our priorities that are under our soil, they're little G gods, they're idols. And we're draw, we trying, trying to draw life from them. And we've got to get them out of the soil. We've got to get them in the tree. And we've got to treat them as God teaches me to treat them. My tablet shut off. It's probably because I've been ignoring her. Okay. All right. So you've probably noticed that we haven't really touched, we haven't really touched on uh, the book of Mark yet. We're getting there. 
Uh, so what's going to happen now is I am going to stop talking, and Isaac is going to come out, and he is going to pick up, um, he's going to pick us up here, and I'm going to ask the whiteboard to go away. Hello. Hi. Hi. My name is Isaac. Um, I lead our student ministries here. Um, did he get your first fill in the blank? No. All right. The first fill in the blank is not on the TV. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh. Hello. Check room two. There we go. That's the first fill in the blank. That's the first fill in the blank. <laughs> Can we move over here a little bit? Sure. So, we have reached the end of chapter four in Mark. So we've spent three weeks on chapter four. We're at the end now. It's not super far into the book, but we've seen a lot of stuff happen so far. Uh, we see Jesus has casted out a lot of demons. Uh, he's healed many, many people, and he's been teaching uh, his disciples, but also just everyone else that is going to him and listening. These disciples uh, have watched Jesus do all these miraculous things. Like he, he, they watched him. Like they, he was right in front of them. So this isn't just like a book. This isn't just a story that they're reading. This is, they're seeing this, they're watching this, they're experiencing it right in front of them. How cool would that be? That'd be really cool. So the passage we're looking at today will show us that the disciples are still little treelings. Their roots aren't very deep. They're still, um, they're still fragile, which is not a roast to them. There's just the beginning of their journey. They're still weak. They've not grown their roots yet. They're still growing. So this story that we're going to be reading is a story about a storm that the disciples went through. Do I do, I do this? No. Okay. So that, this is Mark chapter 4, verses 35. That day when evening came... Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was, meaning he was already in the boat, so they took him just as he was. In the boat, there were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Then the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is a pretty cool story. Uh, we're going to jump into this because there are many uh, phenomenal observations in just this small passage but there are at least two points that we kind of need to take away from this story. So the first one being, oh, okay. Um, can we look at verse 37 and 38 by itself? Is there one before this? Can I just read out your Bible? 37 and 38. Oh, 37. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? So visualizing this, this is a boat, not a super big boat, and it's open. Like, it's not like a yacht. Like, there's no, like, cabin. Like, this is an open boat, and there's a lot of people. There could be 13 people on this boat. Um, most of the people that are in the boat are fishermen, meaning that they spend their lives in boats. They know the do's and the don'ts of being in a storm, mainly that you don't be in a boat during a storm. <laughs> so they, they knew where they were. They were comfortable with where they were. This could have been nighttime, so maybe they didn't see the storm coming. But regardless, they should have been able to, at 
at least a little bit know that there is a storm coming. They should be able to recognize that. And even after that, we see that at this point, the waves were breaking over and the boat was swamped. This is when they took action after it was being swamped. Some biblical imagination leads me uh, to think that they knew that Jesus was sleeping and like they didn't want to wake him because they were like, this is my territory. I know what to do when we get a storm. Let me fix it. And so they spent the first however much time themselves trying to keep the boat together, trying to fix it. Uh, when, we were, when we were looking at this, I found a picture of, of this. And you see on the right side that they're literally holding the side of the boat. <laughs> like they're trying to pull the boat back together. There's three guys trying to hold the thing that's in the middle. It's the sail, yep. Uh, they're, they're trying to hold it up. And then there's just Jesus going like this, <laughs> sleeping away. Um, there's, <laughs> there's, it's like they're trying to fix it within their own power. It seems like a noble thing. They're like they're using the abilities that they've been given to, to fix a problem that's there. But they were trying to do it on their own, and they waited until the destruction already happened before they asked for help, which is my first fill in the blank, which is do we run to Jesus before the storm or after destruction? So going back to this image of the tree in a storm, do we wait till we lose all our branches and all our leaves? Do we wait until our tree is hanging at a 45 degree angle before calling out to Jesus, asking him to save us or asking him to help us. Or as soon as the storm is coming, we look to him first. We tighten our grip on his love for protection because that is the protection that he gives us. That's the way that he protects us. So do we actually take advantage of that? Do we actually look to that? Not only does the disciples wait till destruction already came in order to wake up Jesus, I want to look at the way that they actually addressed Jesus in their panic and distress. It says, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down. I used to read this and acknowledge, like, well, yeah, they were about to die. <laughs> so they had a right to be panicked. They had a right to be scared. And so, and what they did was that they went to Jesus, which is what you're supposed to do. And then I was confused as to why Jesus' response was like, what's y'all's problem? Like, come on. I want to recognize quick that it's crazy for Jesus to be sleeping on this boat during the storm. Like, that's wild, <laughs> that he's just taking a nap as the boat is filling. He wasn't under anything. He was getting wet. And these men, these 12 men, are literally crying for their lives. Um, oh, hold on. I kind of imagine um, Jesus is laying there, like, pretending to be asleep, kind of, like, opening his eyes a little bit just to see if the disciples are going to do something. <laughs> Um, peek it every now and then. But I, I don't think that's what, well, actually what happened. But it's funny to imagine. And regardless of the sleeping thing, the disciples did the thing that I figured they were supposed to do. Then they went to Jesus. But the way that they asked Jesus for help was so accusative. They said, they basically said, Jesus, do you see what's happening? How can you care so little about us? What's your problem, man? I thought you loved me. There's a difference between responding like that and simply waking Jesus up. Just going to him saying, Jesus, we're in trouble. I need your help. I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. Tell me how I can help. You've done all these miraculous things. We've watched it. We believe that you are the son of God. I trust that you will protect us. But instead they said, 
How can you care so little about us? It was so accusative. Which response do we take in our storms? My next fill in the blank is, it, great, it takes great faith to respond in storms with unwavering trust in Jesus. Okay. It takes great faith, which is the first blank, to respond in storms with unwavering trust in Jesus. If we're being upfront and honest, that's really hard. That's not just an easy thing for us to do, or it's not an easy thing for us to learn. The disciples were literally crying for their lives, probably making messes in their pants, of which they probably didn't have any. Um, how could they be calm? How could they be calm in this? But isn't that the goal? Isn't our goal to be calm in storms, to look at him in storms? So how do we get to that point? Well, I remember hearing from someone really smart something like, if our roots are sunk into an adequate source of life, we will be strong, which is the first fill in the blank that you had, which is the point that he had. <laughs> it needs to become a natural habit for us to go to Jesus when storms approach. It needs to be as natural as having all four seasons in Ohio in February. It should just become a habit that as soon as we hit the storm, we go to him. But it only becomes a habit the more that we practice and the more that we do it and the more that we focus on God and our soil. So there's one, one more part in this passage that should probably catch our attention. And it's how the disciples reacted to Jesus after he commanded uh, the storms and everything to go away. After he commanded one of the most powerful forces in our world they said, they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They said, whoa. They recognized what he just did, which is, a, which is the appropriate response that we have to something like that. When Jesus does something, when Jesus does a mir such a miracle, our, the appropriate response that we take is whoa. My last fill in the blank is that when God acts, we are filled with great awe. If our reaction to God is anything other than awe, then there's probably a disconnect somewhere in us. That there, this, this disconnect, which might seem small, is very, very dangerous. It's not actually small disconnect. And that should worry us. If we see, you know, we've been talking about all these great things that Jesus did. If we see Jesus do something and we're not filled with that all, that might, that might be a little red flag to us. Our red flag. It should worry us. I kind of had the image of like movies or TV shows when the main character is in their conflict part of the story and they're going through a meltdown and we see them make a last ditch attempt by saying if anyone's up there you know help me with this thing that I'm going through save me it's kind of like a little Hail Mary thrown up there if anyone's up there help me and maybe we have had times where we did that after we've already experienced the destructions and our storms but then in the movies, when their conflict is resolved, we praise the main character for their, their the great thing that they did, or sticking through their problems, or solving their problems. We praise them for their smartness, um, these kind of things. Whatever else that they use to find the resolution. But maybe the reason why we don't see God's great works is because we aren't looking. Maybe we aren't filled at all at anything related to God because we choose to base our existence on what we do. We choose to put ourselves or other things in the soil. And we aren't looking. We aren't going to be going out and rebuking storms, rebuking winds, 
We're not going to be commanding waves to be still. We might try, but then we're going to lose our voice because it's not going to do anything. We aren't going to be going out to heal people, to cast out demons, and transform people's lives in our own power and authority. There's only one who can do that. There's only one that can calm the storms in our lives. Only one that can give us the love that we need to stay calm in our storms. Kind of what Pastor Jim was saying, like, do you want peace? Because this is how. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so I'd like to introduce you to uh, to uh, yeah, we're gonna need that. Uh, to Katie, uh, Katie Snyder. Uh, Katie has gone through um, <clears throat> through Equip. Uh, she is she is uh, in Equip 2.0 right now, and I thought this would be a really good day for her to share um, some things about her experience as she's been growing. So, <clears throat> Katie, uh, oh, that was nice. Katie, talk about living through the storms in your life without a trust in Jesus. I just wanted to start by saying we didn't like sit down ahead of time and talk about this, so it'll be really funny you hearing my responses after everything uh, was preached today. Um, so my storms beforehand, when there were storms in my life, um, I was definitely living in my own strength and my own power. Um, I would say like 10 years ago, I was severely depressed. Um, like physically, I couldn't get out of bed. Um, like everything hurt. I would call off work. I was sick. I was tired. Um, I was stressed. I had terrible habits. I was angry at everything. Um, and everything I tried to do, I just tried to resolve in my own power, in my own strength. And it, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So what made the switch in you and how do you handle the storms of life now? So I think there were multiple things that happened, but um, God was always chasing after me. He, he never left me. Um, so I think it kind of started, I had a friend um, who invited me to their small group, and she had invited me for years, but I, I made excuses, and I didn't go, and then finally I ran out of excuses. So I finally started going, um, and then I had community with these women, and I had some big godly people, and I was learning, and I was in scripture. Um, and then we actually started coming to New Hope two years ago. Um, and I had been in counseling for a while, clinical counseling. Um, and then I had finally met Jim. God put Jim in my path. Um, and I started Christian counseling. Um, and I don't know, I have to tell this story real fast. I don't know if you remember, but I remember going into counseling, and I remember, I don't know if I was this rude about it, but I said, I said, if you are going to sit here and tell me to just journal everything away, I am walking out. <laughs> and you paused, and you looked at me, and you said, well, I don't think journaling's bad, but... So then we started talking, um, and then that's when Jim really um, taught me about taking my thoughts captive, which was um, something big in my life. Um, and then I, I went through Equip 1.0, which was amazing. Um, there was a lot of processing I did. Um, There's just a lot of teaching um, like biblical truth that you learn through Equip. Um, and then, you know, as you were drawing your tree and everything, I kind of told my husband, I was like, they're stealing my thunder up there because the spiritual disciplines are one of the biggest things in my life that have made a difference. So through all that, um, I'm just continuing to grow and listening to God's will. Like God told me, you know, time to lead a small group. So I lead a small group. Um, and actually, as I was Jim gave me the questions ahead of time. Um, God gave me a scripture that I think perfectly sums up this question. Um, so I was reading this week, and Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's good. <clears throat> So you've taken some very intentional steps over these last two years to grow. What would you suggest to folks out here who have, who have chosen not to take intentional steps towards their growth? Um, I would say there is just so much freedom. Like I have true joy, true love, true happiness now that I really never thought I was going to get. 
Um, so like my recommendation is to equip. If you have any desire to do equip, um, you just learn so much through that. Um, another thing I would say is small groups. Small groups are great because you have fellowship with others, you can talk to others, you can live life with others. There's people there that are for you and you're, you're studying God's word every week. Um, and then my last thing is the spiritual disciplines, which are so important in my life. Um, my days do not go well if I do not intentionally spend time in the morning with prayer with God in his word, meditating on his word, um, and just, just being in his presence in so many different ways. So those yeah. would be my steps. Thanks. Thanks. We all have choices as to how we're going to live out our walk with God. And for, for us as believers, we have the, we have the privilege of, um, of, of walking with a God who has promised us that he would never turn his back on us. That, that, wants us to, that he wants us to grow in our relationship with him even more than we want to grow in our relationship with him. He wants us to succeed. One of the cool things he did is, is he gave his son. And that's what, that's what we, we celebrate uh, once a month. We celebrate communion. And today is the day. We get to celebrate communion today. 